Hey, beloved saints. I wanted to do something again. The, the, what's concerning me, it's not just that people aren't getting the simplicity of the gospel. Um, that we trust only in the work that was completed by Christ as the only thing that justifies it. But, but not just that. Uh, it concerns me that people are not even remaining in God's grace and in the spirit for the purpose of the experiential sanctification. See, there's positional sanctification, which was a one-time event uh, that we are set apart, made holy by God because of the blood of Christ. Just like the tools, I've said before, the items that were like the showbread table, these items were sanctified. Now, these are inanimate objects, but they're holy, just like we're holy. And it has nothing to do with our performance because it's God that set us apart and it's the blood that has cleansed us and made us holy. It has nothing to do with anything we're doing. And the only way to actually grow uh, spiritually from a real place is to abide in God's grace and allow the spirit to move us and to prompt us. Not the dead letter of the law, not fear, not condemnation, not trying to work to obtain something that God has freely offered by his grace through his son. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So I get concerned when people say you have to do this, your heart has to be this way. Uh, so now it's about you and, and what, how good the ground is. Uh, uh, for salvation. Um, now it's about uh, what you're willing to do or some promise that you're going to make to God that you're going to stop doing these bad things and start doing good ones as part of what saves you. All of these are good and proper in their place, but not as part of what saves you. Now, people seem to think that you must promise to be a good person but here's the issue God's standard is perfection Jesus Christ met that standard he fulfilled the law he lived the perfect life so God's justice is served his law was kept by man because it's by the obedience of one Jesus is God in the flesh but he came in the form of a man He's all man and all God. It's, it's a very, it's the mystery, the mystery of godliness is Christ. In him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh, just like the mystery of iniquity is Satan manifesting in the flesh, uh, the mystery of godliness is God manifesting in the flesh. So here's the thing. People seem to think that they, they, they can like get some level, some vague level of goodness in order to be saved or to promise to have a vague standard of goodness that doesn't meet God's standard of perfection, but nobody knows what that standard is. And, and I want to tell you that when I say that the Bible is clear on how all of our righteousness is, not our sin, but the best we can offer is filthy rags before there's nothing good, nothing, nothing that we can do and perform that impresses God or moves him at all is, is, is in regards to salvation. Nothing without faith is impossible to please God. All right. The only thing that pleases God is when you do his will, which is all who see the son believe on him. That's it. It's to trust in the savior and what the savior did. So here, there are none good. There's none righteous. There's not a just man anywhere. It tells us that. All have fallen short of the glory of God. There's not one righteous. No, not one. The issue here is that there is none good people. I don't care. I get this from atheists all the time. So you can tell me like a really good person just because they don't believe in Jesus. There, there's none good. You're, you're not getting it. When you aren't perfect, which God knows you can't be, that's why he made salvation easy. His plan was to redeem you before you fell. It says that, that Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. 
that problem. When Adam fell, there was a, a, a remedy for it already in place. God, uh, you can see that in the covenant. When Abraham's put to sleep and the furnace and the torch walk through the animal parts, that's the father and the son. See, he swore by himself. He made a covenant with himself. The promise came before the law. It tells us that the, the promise is not disannulled because the law came and we couldn't keep it. The law was given so that every mouth may be stopped and all become guilty before God to be a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. We're no longer under a schoolmaster. See, it's just to point us to Jesus. So there are no good people. So the answer is there's only bad people that have been washed in the blood and made alive in Christ, have a new spirit, but are still in the old flesh. And there's bad people that have rejected the only way to salvation, which is the blood of Christ. So there's only bad people. There's those that have trusted in Christ and have been given God's righteousness, imputed upon them by faith. And then there's the bad people that haven't. And most of the time, it's the bad people that think they're somewhat good or have to obtain some level of human merit or righteousness in order to obtain salvation. And that concerns me because they are rejecting the gospel. The gospel is the work of Christ that gives you eternal life. It is the blood of Christ was shed for you. It was a propitiation. He was a propitiation for our sins. Me and he appeased God. He satisfied God. We owed the wages of sin is death and we owe God. But Jesus paid that debt for us. Now, you either accept that payment as full to talistai, paid in full. It was a payment of a financial term in Greek, to talistai, paid in full. It's finished. Or you don't. There, there's none of this. If you add a but or an and after it's Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and rose again on the third day, because of that, we have eternal life. And you go, yeah, but you, or yeah, and you must, or yeah, but you have to have, or yeah, but you can lose it, or yeah, it's all nonsense. And you are ashamed of the gospel of Christ. So there are none good. There's only bad people. See, this is in God's eyes. Everybody is equally lost. Everybody. It doesn't matter how good your sweet little aunt or grandma was. It doesn't matter how bad this guy was, Hitler or some serial killer that we all seem to think is. Jesus Christ came to die for the worst of sinners. And we need to all see ourselves as lost. Just as lost as the serial killer. No better than him. Grandma wasn't better. He, no, everybody is equally lost. We are all dead without Christ. All right? dead and trespasses and sins. Now, once we're saved, one of the things I see is even if a church is right on the gospel, then they start preaching law for sanctification. Experiential, not positional. Positionally, you're set. You're sanctified. You're set apart. You're holy by God because of the blood of Jesus. Nothing you're doing. But experiential sanctification, the process of getting better and living more, being more Christ-like, all of that comes from growing in grace. Through the milk of the word, being led of the spirit, not looking at ourselves, knowing our identity in Christ, who he says we are as he is. So are we in this world. He is just righteous, holy. He has all the promises. He's the beloved child of the living God. And so are we. But then they, instead of doing that, they start preaching condemnation and law, thinking that's going to help people overcome sinful things in their life. And the law only strengthens sin. It never helps. And so why are we beginning in the spirit and going to the flesh to be perfected? Now, there was a time where circumcision was being brought in. And they were saying, okay, you started in the flesh, but you're now made perfect by the flesh. You know, you started in the spirit, but now you're perfect by the flesh. It doesn't even make sense. And I'm getting concerned about this. Because even if they get the gospel right, they, they actually preach law instead of preaching the identity we have in Christ. And, and if, I really want people to get this. You are bad. Like in God's sight, unless you've accepted Christ and he sees you through his son, you're bad. You're lost. You're not good. 
but Christ died for you. He loved you. God loved you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John talks about what manner of love is this? You know, God sent his son. God in the flesh died for us so that we could live with him forever. See, people mix up this flesh. I wish I could explain it. Once you're born of God, that one can't sin. The seed of Christ, the Holy Spirit in you. It's not possible. Okay, that guy is the one that gets into heaven. This flesh, we're supposed to reckon it dead so that we can have a better walk and manifest it and act more Christ-like, right? But this flesh does not inherit the kingdom. Flesh, flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom, right? This guy dies. It's the spirit that gets into heaven. That's why the righteousness in your flesh Oh, don't touch this. Don't drink that. Don't eat that. None of that has anything to do with you being justified in the sight of God. That's what you're doing in your flesh. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. Okay, this is kind of serious. Can I, can I talk? Um, that was his Mars uh, uh, celestial buddy, plushie. I took him to the uh, NASA Space Museum today. So, um... And we watched a great little IMAX movie about puppy dogs that are heroes that um, go and rescue people. It was really neat. Okay, I digress. So, uh, that guy gets a new body that's sinless. That glorified body, the corruption puts on incorruptible. And this mortality puts on immortality. That guy, that spirit, with that new flesh, it's going to be flesh and bone like Jesus. But some kind of different physical body that we're getting that's the guy that gets into heaven you see the spirit is joined to a new glorified body and we're risen again like christ you see so that's who gets into heaven this body this flesh he he's gone he's already we're just reckon him dead act as if he died on the cross with christ and through the holy spirit we're baptized into christ there's one body uh, and we're all parts of it. We all have our own gifts um, in in Christ. So I, I I really want people to get that they're not good. They need to see themselves as just not good and not even able to qualify. Like they need to throw their hands up in the air. Like when the apostles asked Jesus, well, then who can be saved? Great. That's exactly what you should ask. With you, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. See, God has to save you through the foolishness of preaching. You hear the message of Christ, you believe it, then you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. You trust in him, and you know you have eternal life. Now, once that happens, then the Holy Spirit begin, begins his work in you, you see? But that's where people are putting the law in, thinking that's going to help people grow, and it's not. So... I want to give you some verses. Uh, I, I People just have to see themselves as bad. Once they're saved, they're the righteousness of God in Christ. They've got to know how beloved they are of God. I don't want people condemned. I want unsaved people condemned and giving up so that they can get saved by trusting and resting in Christ. I'm so sick of people saying you can lose salvation. Sir, how? How are you keeping it? If it can be lost, please tell me, how do I keep my salvation? By works, right? By my faithfulness? It's not God's faithfulness. You see, you're in error. Because God gave me his righteousness when I trusted in Christ. That's permanent. I have been bought. I have been born of God into the family of God. I can't be unborn. Now, I can suffer terrible consequences and chastisement and even lose my physical life early. I can lose reward. You know, I have to stand before God and tell him what I did with the free gift he gave me. But never salvation. And if you think you can lose it, I want to know how you think you're keeping it. I guarantee it's your faithfulness and works. Well, I'm doing it by not sinning. Liar. You still sin. You're just blind to how much you sin under God's standard of the law. You know, there's only bad people, unrighteous people that are either covered by the blood or there's unrighteous people not covered by the blood. It's as simple as that. There, There's unrighteous sinners, unsaved, 
bad people, <laughs> and you're either purged by the blood and made uh, God's righteousness by faith, or you've rejected it, and you're trying to get in some other way, and you can't, you know? Hey, I don't underestimate God's mercy. Some people say, hey, how do we know they're not saved? Well, Paul warns that Christ is of none effect to people that are trying to be justified by the law. Um, and that there's a double curse on anybody trying to preach another gospel. So I must be obedient here and tell the real gospel and contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. But I don't underestimate God's mercy. I really don't. So I wanted to read in Hebrews 10.10. 10. This is about our, you know, I did a video called Positional Versus Experiential Sanctification. And again, I'm really concerned people are trying to get sanctified by looking at the law and looking at themselves. I'm talking about experiential here, uh, instead of knowing who they are in Christ. So, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. See, you've been made holy once for all because of the offering of Jesus, because he is the propitiation. He is the thing that appeased God. His wrath was poured out. His justice was served. And now the gates of heaven are open for us. He sees us as just as righteous as Jesus is because he counts our faith as righteousness. Now, if God is willing to give us his perfection and righteousness given to us as a gift, imputes it upon us, why would you try to bring in parts of your righteousness? Well, I'm going to bring in this. I stop this sin. I stop that sin. Well, don't you know if you offend in one, you're guilty of all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know that counts for something. No, you're still lost. You're still a bad person that's not purged by the blood. It, it doesn't matter. None of that can be offered for salvation. If you have sin in your life, get rid of it. You're, if you're a Christian, you shouldn't have all that garbage in your life. It, it, you know, it gives Jesus a bad name. It turns people from God. But come on, that has nothing to do with your salvation. There's only bad people <laughs> that are either purged by the blood or not. Period. It's just the blood. I mean, what what can't people get about that? It's only the sacrifice of Jesus that makes any of us presentable. And, and if you say there's something more, I want to know how are you adding that? And how insulting to Jesus is it to say that he's not a competent savior, that you're going to add some of your works in there and see if that can stir up God, get some kudos from God for that. That's just crazy. All right, and we know that in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, that we are not unrighteous anymore. See, the unrighteous who won't inherit are the same unjust unbelievers mentioned earlier in the chapter in 1 Corinthians when Paul asked them, hey, why are you letting these people judge your cases, like your legal cases against people, your legal issues? Because one day you're going to judge angels. Don't you know the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom? You will. You'll be judging angels. Why can't you judge your own court cases? Your own legal differences? Why do you need to bring them before unbelievers? These judges that don't even believe. Don't you know the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom? You will. You should be judging your own. And if you read it in context, that's what it talks about. The unjust. Why do you take your uh, cases before the unjust don't you know the unrighteous? So that's not who we are. And then he says, don't you know the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom? And then goes on to list the sins that the unrighteous will be condemned for. Why? Because the blood hasn't purged it. It's still on their account. And they will answer for that. See, there's one sin that, that makes you lost. And that's unbelief in Christ. All right? So he goes on saying. The, the unrighteous won't inherit, and these are the works that the unrighteous do. And such were some of you, but ye are washed. Ye are washed. You were the unrighteous. You were those that did these things, right? You were judged by those sins because you were dead. You didn't even have a spirit that was alive to move you. The seed of Christ wasn't in you. You were dead in your trespasses. And such were some of you, but ye are washed. By what? the blood of Jesus. But ye are sanctified. Do you see that's a past tense? What's that? Experiential or positional? 
positional. Experiential is something that goes on your whole life. This is an event. You are sanctified. It's a done deal. So you are holy. You're washed. You're holy. But ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Do you see? You're holy. You're justified. It means some people like to use the, the cute little slogan, justified, never sinned. Just, if it, just as if you'd never sin again. See? God lives in eternity. He knew all your sins were future when Jesus died for you. He knew. Uh, and it says that you're sanctified. So you're washed. You're cleansed. You're sanctified, holy, set apart. You are justified, declared righteous in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So the Holy Spirit in you is what makes you holy, righteous, cleansed. You're no longer the unrighteous. Such were some of you, but you're washed, sanctified, justified in the name of Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, the Holy Spirit. So I, I really just want people to understand it has nothing to do with it. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. So what does it quicken mean? He brought you to life. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Does God want all of his children to live really godly lives? Yes, he does. You will not achieve like any level of true holiness and love or righteousness unless the spirit is leading you. If you're trying to do it through your flesh, taste not, touch not, handle not, I am righteous. That That's... Mm. We begin in the Spirit, we remain in the Spirit. It tells us that we should walk in newness of life. And that we should walk, it, like, walk as Christ did. Alright? Because the same Spirit is in us. So, and you has the quickened, brought to life, who were dead in trespasses and sin. So do you see here? There's no good people. There's dead, bad people. You weren't just a sinner, you know, that needed help. Uh, no, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You couldn't even do anything good. It wasn't possible. But when you put your trust in Christ, the blood washes you clean. You're holy. And then that spirit begins work in you. Absolutely, the Holy Spirit does begin work in us. And he will perform that until the day of Jesus Christ. All right, we we have to trust in him. I'm trying to get people to stop trusting in themselves in any way and to trust in Christ. Now it says, "Where in time past you walked and I have a bunch of stuff. Galatians 5, it's just too much. Uh, I might do something on 1 John again uh, cuz so many people are confused on it, but I just can't get to all that tonight, but uh, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world? According to the prince of the power of the air. So because you had no Holy Spirit, you were dead in your trespasses and sin, you walked according to the prince of the power of the air. He's the one that guided you. Okay? You lived on the world's terms. You wanted things of the world. You let the flesh and the fleshly fallen mind guide you. Alright? Now, even once we're saved, we've got, we delight in the laws of God in our inward man. See? The new spirit really wants it, but the flesh wars against it. See, we're supposed to, we're going to fight that good fight, though. I'm not saying don't fight. I'm just saying, don't think you're justified by it. You're not being saved by any of it. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. A lot of people think the children of disobedience are saved people that aren't living right. I, I just, it's so clear in scripture, the children of disobedience are unbelievers. All right? Children of disobedience are unbelievers in Christ. That's who the children of disobedience are. It, it, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will come. He'll convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Of sin because they do not believe on me. Okay? 
and then of righteousness, because he goes uh, unto his Father, and he'll be here no more. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of our right standing with God, and the righteous thing to do, okay? And it says, uh, that spirit still works in children of disobedience, the unbelievers, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Okay, why? But Because we hadn't been washed by the blood. But now we've been reconciled to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have been given uh, mercy. All right? It says, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Do you see that? We are already seated in heavenly places. As he is, so are we in this world. That's why I'm so tired of people saying you can lose salvation. These people think they're keeping it. And again, by what? By their work, by trying not to sin, by not sinning. They can't, they can't see, like, even their pride it just gives me, like, the heebie-jeebies. Ugh. Ugh. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I left that on my tip thing today when I took Jim to the museum. I put um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 uh, on the thing. I, I like doing that. Because sometimes people just get curious what it is. And then they see that salvation is free. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. See, where people sell us the good works. We're, that's the whole point. We're created unto good works. But we're not saved by them. That's God's will for his children. And it's not always the works you think that are good. You know, it, that's a long story, but uh, it it's amazing to me how many people just cannot get, you just got to trust in God and nothing you do, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them, should walk in what? The good works that he, that he wanted us to walk in because we're his workmanship, all right? Wherefore, remember that ye, being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh, made by hands. So he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, you know, that at the time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, Ye who sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Are made what? Close to God by the blood of Jesus. That's how we have peace with God. Through the blood of Jesus alone. Just like Passover. Did the, did the death uh, angel come to the door and say, um, I see you got blood there, uh, but how are you living? Are you drinking tonight? No, I'm going to take the firstborn anyway. No, it was the blood. Uh, blood's on the door, I'm passing over. Blood's on the door, I'm passing over. Blood's on me, death's passing over. Blood's on you, second death passes over. Blood's on you, you are saved. I, I wish people could get it. It's just the blood. For he is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. I'm sorry, what did he do? He abolished in his flesh the law of commandments contained in the ordinances for to make in himself of twain, of two, one new man. So making peace. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. See, we were at war. We were an enemy of God and the enemy of Israel. Because we were pagans and they believed in the one true God. And he abolished in his flesh the law of commandments contained in the ordinances. See, Gentiles and Jews weren't supposed to be around each other. 
they would be considered defiled if they walked in a Gentile's house. For to make in himself of twain one new man. So making peace. He made peace for us to God by his own blood. And he made peace between the Gentiles and the Jews. One new man in Christ. All right. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. So he's saying uh, uh, the Jews were preached to at first and then the Gentiles. That's why it says the first will be last, the last will be first. That's a long story. For through him we both have access by, access by one spirit unto the Father. So how do we have access to God? Through the Holy Spirit. I, I'm trying to prove it in every Bible book there is. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. He's saying the Jews and the Gentiles, there's no difference. We are close to God because of Jesus. It's because of his blood. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Remember it says he's a stone the builders rejected. Talking about Israel rejected he is the chief cornerstone. Behold, I lay before you is a Zion, a stumbling, a, stu a, a rock of offense. They rejected him. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth into a holy temple of the Lord. That's his body, us. In whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So he's warning, he's, he's not warning us, but reminding us all that we are the temples of God. No Jew, no Gentile, both Jew and Gentile. One new man in Christ. And it's all because of the blood of Jesus. The offering of his body. His work that made us alive again. That made us born of God. It had, and uh, we're saved unto good works, absolutely. But never part of, never part of that uh, mixed with salvation. I just, oh, I just pray people can get it. Again, there's no good people. It's all bad people, either covered by the blood or not. You know? Like one for one of my friends said, I think it was Eberly. Was it you, Eberly? It says, he didn't come to make bad people good, to make, but to make dead people alive. Praise God. All right, guys. Lots of love to you. I love you. God bless.